Welcome to the One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. Today, I chat with Mary Kruger about shame and addiction. Hey, everyone. I hope you're well. It is finally starting to be a little summery here in New Hampshire. I'm still wearing a sweater, but that's fine. (laughs) I have hope. Um, I'm super excited about this episode with Mary. Mary is a lead trainer with the IFS Institute, and she's one of the authors and developers of the Level 2 IFS and Addiction Training, which we talk about. And uh, we just have a super fun time talking about addiction. We talk about shame. That seems to be the thread throughout our conversation so let's go ahead and just jump in. If you want to connect with Mary, you can email her at marykruger at sbcglobal.net or you could reach out to her through her website at mpkruger.com. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse at IFS Tammy. You can join the One Inside Facebook page. I would love to connect. Um, I want to just end with one of the things that Mary said, which I just loved this so much. She talks about looking inside, even though a part may fear the badness and the shame that might be found there and the healing power we have when we take back in who we truly are intended to be. Enjoy. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Nice to see you in person. I know. It's nice to see you too. I like your blue room. Oh, thank you. This is my son's uh, teenage bedroom. It was the alternative to black when he was 14. Mm-hmm. Yes. My 10 year old son loves the color black too. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't, he's not into it so much anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> that was the phase. Yeah. yeah. Mine thinks it's cool. Like the color black is cool. Right. Right. Yeah. We went through the phase with the band shirts also, only wearing t-shirts with band oh. logos on. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever but that? was that? years ago. Did you do that as a kid? I never did the band t-shirt thing. No, that wasn't around when I was a kid. <laughs> I don't like t-shirts though. I don't think I, I don't look good or they're not comfortable. Like t-shirts aren't comfortable. So I was never... I was into them like um, when I was in college. Yeah. Okay. I picked a few, but they had to be like cool t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I love starting with just asking asking you where you are in the world and what would you see if you looked out your nearest window? Well, where I am in the world is an interesting question. <laughs> um, it could be answered in a lot of ways, but actual location, I'm in Connecticut. Um, I'm right outside of New Haven, um, and uh, as I look out my window, I'm so fortunate and blessed because every morning I see these amazing trees, and it's spring, so they're just leafing now. So I get to like really see the seasons change, and it's just so lovely, and there's like animals and birds, and it's just a really nice way to start my day. I look out my window and see that every day. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Part of me is very curious, though, about other ways you would answer that question. Ah, uh, where I am in the world is, um, I feel like I'm a citizen of the world, and I could be anywhere. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel this connection to a lot of different cultures and people. Mm. Yeah, even those that I don't know. But it's more of a energetic feeling. Yeah. 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 But it warms my heart to believe that we're all interconnected, even though we don't know each other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and with self energy, right? If we all we all have self energy, then we are connected, right? We're connected by that and maybe even in other ways too. Yes. And that's what I that's what I feel. I yeah. feel that connection. Yeah. I love that. That's a beautiful answer. So I would love to hear about how you started in IFS and then you, how you started with, um, 
working with addictions and how much you want to share of that story. I think I would, I would love to hear that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just name the IFS first. I mean, thank you, Ralph Cohen. He's uh, at CCSU. He's um, a friend and colleague of mine. And I, uh, I had for years been supervising students for him and he introduced me to the meta frameworks book they were using. And then said to me one day, would you like to come and take a class with Dick Schwartz? I said, sure. <laughs> and that was um, when I took that first class, it was 1999. So yeah, yeah. And, and was I that before like, Dick moved here or was that right after he moved here? Oh, he was in Chicago. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was at that time, there was only training in Chicago and Connecticut, and I think a little bit in Germany, yeah. Yeah, well, I've heard that, that Ralph Cohen is so instrumental in getting IFS in the Northeast. And yeah, so that's exciting. Do you yeah. still work Do you still work at the college? No, I didn't work at the college. I had been running a private practice for about, I had a private practice for 25 years and I would take students in as interns. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a, okay. I'm a supervisor, AMFT supervisor. So I would uh, work on their internship with them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And marriage and family therapy. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And and so you you were friends with with Ralph, and then you came to a workshop with Dick, and what happened? I walked into the room, um, and I looked around because I was just there, barely in time. And I looked over, and I said, "Oh no, I've signed up for this course, and that's Dick Schwartz. Oh, it looks like it's going to be a really boring time for six six weekends." <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember Mike Elkin waved me over to come sit next to him. I didn't know him yet. And uh, that was my introduction. But as I began to listen to Dick, I could see just how the work that he was doing really fits in with what I was doing and more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I'm a system of thinker and I just love that way of looking at things. Yeah. 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 And I love that he brought it in, in here. Yeah. yeah. And Mary is, is just went, put it, her, put her hands on her heart when she said in here. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So he put it in here where other systems are sort of, we put it inside, he put it inside where other systems weren't doing that. Right. Right. We were looking at family systems and cultural systems and, um, you know, institutional systems and legacy, you know, ethnicity stuff, but we weren't looking so much at what was happening in, in the inner world. And um, and Dick did bring that to marriage and family therapy. And it was just, for me, a really fabulous thing, yeah. you know, because a lot of my clients were kind of stuck about how much further they could go. Yeah, yeah. And some of our IFS things that we do, like unburdening and um, befriending parts and things like that are, um, you know, a complete paradigm shift. and really resonated with me. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And then tell me about your addiction, your passion about addiction and how that fits in. Well, I always say I was born to it. Yeah, you see. Yeah. And uh, some people who know me know this story. But when I was a little girl, I was helping my mom um, clean the fridge out. That's what we had to do then. No defroster. And I cut my hand. I dropped my father's beer bottle on the ground and cut my hand and had to get stitches. So I've had the scar on my palm. And now I felt like it foretold my future, right? So I was exposed to it, you know, growing up. Um, my father, uh, my father's father, my stepfather. And um, so I used to feel badly about it, but then I realized it opened horizons for me. Um, and then, of course, along with that eating disorder piece was my own eating disorder that developed out of trauma I experienced from my stepfather who was quite violent and crazy. Mm. And um, so, yeah, so I, I got into um, some 12 step rooms, you know, in my twenties and that opened the door for me. You know, I went from feeling like I was a flawed human being to realizing that this picture was much greater. Mm. And uh, yeah. So when I became a therapist, I just always wanted to have that part of my work. I guess I'm curious about your integration of that with IFS and it's in my impression, I don't know if this is right or not, but my impression is you were the one that brought in that addiction treatment to IFS. 
Well, I'm the one that developed the level two program, okay. but it would be way unfair to not say that. First of all, I was influenced highly by Mike Elkin's work. He's, he's well known in the fields um, for over 50 years. And C. Sykes, um, who was around longer than I was in the IFS community, has, is also integral in the addiction um, program that we have. Um, but I was the one that wrote up the manuals and started doing the level two trainings. Um, and now Cease and I are doing some of them one together and splitting a few of them up. But so it's kind of a combination yeah. of, of us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So she's my buddy. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we both love it. Can we talk a little bit about shifting the traditional paradigm with IFS addictions and eating disorders? Yeah, I'm, um, yes, that's a big focus of uh, what we teach. And, um, you know, traditional work was just uh, the clinician and the um, client, you know, just working on this specific symptom and basically kind of demonizing it, you know, making it a bad thing, mm. making it something that we have to get rid of, right? Mm -hmm. Which worked for a lot of people, but in IFS, we'd say that was more manager driven recovery for some. And then, you know, as the field advanced, we began to realize the influence of outer systems on folks recovery. So that brings in what I call second order change. The first scenario was first order change. Where we realized the influence of outer systems like family and school and legal system and culture and other folks in the treatment team and how that can impact recovery. From the IFS perspective, the paradigm shift is a number of things. We um, not only recognize those things, but we also recognize that there are parts in the room, that our client is entering with loads of parts, that the therapist has parts, that all these other folks and the other systems all have parts and they're all intermingling and often polarizing with each other. Mm -hmm. So with IFS, we've learned to depolarize or decrease conflict with people's parts, right? Which is what makes people not get along to help move the treatment along. And the biggest, the biggest part of the shift is that we actually befriend the addictive parts, right? Yeah, yeah. Because they have wisdom mm. and they have an intention. Mm. And it's through that, through actually befriending that part that we can begin to help the part see it's not accomplishing its intention, but in a way that that part discovers it not that we're imposing it on the part and then begin to explore what are some options for this part and what are the things underneath that we need to unburden to, to let that change hold. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's really powerful way of working and takes things much deeper, mm -hmm. especially because of that ultimately we can get to unloading the shame that really feeds into most addictions and eating disorders. Really the shame is a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk more about the shame because I was thinking about that the outer systems really just reinforce that shame usually. Yes, uh, but I believe it's because we're shame-based culture. And so shame begets shame. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I think, you know, if we're all experiencing shame, we don't want to experience the shame. So we try to impose it on another person, place, or thing. And we get into dynamics that keep creating more shaming situations. Like if I keep blaming someone for why I'm living a certain way and they blame me back, all that we're doing is making each other feel bad inside and filling the shame reservoir, you know, and so it doesn't shift. Mm. But if we can unburden ourselves of shame, we can change our interactions and more, to more loving interactions, mm. right? And create healing. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and I'm imagining that... Right. So if you think about your, like, if you have a part that, that drinks and then there's all this shame and then that shame is reinforced. And then in order to balance that shame, there's all this blame. So then I'm kind of doing this thing with my hands. Cause I'm imagining then that's sort of that, that's that cycle of like, then I'm blaming everyone else and I'm blaming all these things. And that doesn't help me not drink. It actually probably makes me drink more. Right, right. If I didn't have such a miserable life, if I didn't have all these terrible things that happened to me, 
<laughs> if I didn't live with this miserable person, then I wouldn't have to do this drinking or this drugging or starve myself or any of that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when I engage in it and feel crummy, then I can blame and shame myself. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. You know, I'm such a loser. So I have inner parts that will start to take up the job as well. Mm, okay. Tell me about that. I love that inner parts that take up the job. Yeah. I mean, we all, um, you know, especially uh, from the uh, addictive um, community uh, experience, very big inner critics for our behaviors. Yeah. And those critics uh, continue to shame us even when others aren't. Right. So yeah. even if I'm in the most loving and compassionate relationships and have the most kind treatment team and all that, if we don't befriend and acknowledge that there's an inner shamer happening, that part's going to keep up the work, you know, and keep the person engaging in those behaviors. Yeah. 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 And so do you have an idea of why that is? Why we end up having, sort of, we end up carrying the the shaming voices or sort of, you know, before IFS, we would say, you know, my mom's voice is in my head telling me that I suck or whatever, you know, that I'm bad. Or um, do you have an idea of why that might be that we end up having these inner voices in our head that shame us, that sometimes sound like our abusers or sound like the people that have been so awful to us? Well, I think they're often transmitted through legacy, you know, um, through experience of prior generations. Um, and so we, we take them on in our DNA, you know, not in a permanent kind of way, but we take them on and they become ours. Um, and sometimes we have like really um, difficult experiences that create moral injury, right? So let's say you're a combat veteran and you've had to cross the line and kill people to survive. You might feel shame over that because like inherently it's not something we would naturally do. So we can develop our own shamer, even if we had the best of upbringings, you know, or perhaps um, one was abused, uh, sexually abused, and um, you had a fabulous upbringing, but your soccer coach sexually abused you, and maybe you had a little pleasure about that and still felt guilt, and that can become an inner shamer. So it's a combination of legacy and also personal experience, you know, experiences in which maybe there's been some moral line crossed, you know, moral judgment line. Not yeah. that I'm moralizing it. Yeah. 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 Um, and I wonder if that's also like if we think about shame, our culture of shame, if, if we didn't sort of swim in the culture of shame, then you know, I wonder if we would treat those things differently. I believe we would. Yeah. John Bradshaw has talked about that in his book, uh, the very old book, Healing the Shame That Binds You, but all the things that influence us carrying shame, you know, and um, our cultural messages can be really shaming, you know, who we are, we don't measure up to the standard of how someone should live in our culture, you know, either we don't carry on the traditions, we don't have the right look, we don't make enough money. Mm. All that can contribute to us feeling that we're a worthless person. Yeah, or feeling like physical coach... shame. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Feeling physical sorry. shame. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about, or if the soccer coach abused us, or if we had to kill people in the military, then that's not the norm. And so there must be something wrong with us. And so that's then, I'm going to then have that shame and hold that, believe that, feel that, that yes. shame because of those things that happened to me. Right. Right, because we feel like we've crossed some sort of moral line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a message in that. Yeah. And so when when people begin to shift into befriending those addictive parts, um, what have you seen happen to those to that with that shift, with that paradigm shift of the way we look at addiction and the way we treat addiction? Well, one of the shifts is that my clients that I've worked with begin to tell me what's really going on. So they become more honest. Interesting. Okay. Tell me about mm -hmm. that. I, well, I have a client. I just remember a while back, you know, that this person thanked me. Uh, it was obvious that her eating disorder was talking for a while in, in a very um, blended way in her system. 
and she thanked me for um, allowing it a voice. And she, it, it made her feel better that she could share what was actually going on in detail, you know? Um, so in some paradigms, people are not allowed to share all that. So what happens is the parts hide. They hide and uh, they become stronger, right? So what yeah. I've seen is sort of um, a relaxing in the system and um, a sh more honest sharing with my clients, you know? And also, then I can actually find out what's really happening underneath. What are those exiles that are being covered up? Because that part's going to let me know that, you know? Yeah. I so. love that. Well, think about how much time it would, you know, we we would spend on talking about either hiding from that shame part that we felt so much shame or covering up or minimizing or blaming, right? We'd spend so much time in blaming or shaming then how that would feel so different if I just said, I want to get to know that part. And then right. I can, that part can just come into the room and sort of step into the room. And then we really got to know the part and we were not spending all that time and energy and effort, <laughs> you know, trying to get away from the part. Exactly. It's a lot of work. <laughs> you can physically feel it in your body too. Yes. People will report that when you ask them, what's that like pushing it away? How long have you been trying to push it away? You know, and yeah. Uh, Forever, I've been trying all these things and nothing works. Yeah. Well, my yeah. managers work really hard to try to push it away, right? With right. whatever that is. Right. But yeah. those part, other parts haven't signed on for, for, the, for being pushed away. They're getting resentful and they're just showing their strength more. Yeah. When they talk about the first step, um, I'm powerless over alcohol and my life has become unmanageable for me. Um, what that really means is that the part that's been engaging in the addictive behavior realizes that what it's trying to accomplish is not working and that there's been negative consequences that that part did not intend for the system. Mm. And so the part is really buying into that. Yeah. And, um, and then there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I could see that would be huge, right? Like I've been trying to help you by, you know, restricting or overeating or drinking alcohol or using drugs and that part realizing that that's actually not helping you. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Yeah. And people struggle with that sometimes that language because they, when they hear powerless, they might um, hear that they're a victim. So I reframe it more that way. Yeah. yeah. When I work with folks uh, that are in the, that are in this program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. So I see it more as a, a spiritual path. Um, and it's not, you know, therapy, it's self-help. Well, and I think, right. So if we looked at, if we looked at AA as a spiritual path or even uh, like Weight Watchers is a spiritual path because it could be used that way. I have several right. friends recently. It's so weird. I have several friends recently that are doing Weight Watchers and actually really loving it and saying that, it, that it's gotten them kind of out of the diet culture mindset just with the point system is different than I think it used to be versus like counting cow. I don't know, sort of. Um, so right, both of those things could be and again, I'm sorry I'm comparing them, but these are just sort of the two kind of big systems that I'm thinking about for, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the diet culture um, does feed into the whole management thing and, and it sets us up for failure um, because often it's really unhealthy and it's very regimented. Um, I agree with you. I have someone who, um, you know, some people I work with that lost half their body weight working on their parts and doing Weight Watchers, you know, but they didn't, they just re, what's the word I'm looking for? Just sort of um, reframed how they were working that program. It's really how you work it. Yeah. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Right. 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 I love it, that. It's, it's not going to set you up for failure because they're doing balanced eating, but some of the other diet programs do because they're not doing balanced eating. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's but, not sustainable. Like, I don't know anything about Jenny Craig, but I would imagine that's not super sustainable, but I'm sure people love it. So no offense to anyone who's done well. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody on any plan they're doing. <laughs> I know, but right? If it's working, if it's working for, you. for you. Like that's the other thing about IFS and how I like to work with people is we just work person to person, you know? Yeah. If that something's working for somebody, we're not going to 
you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to go down any road my clients want to go down and be, you know, ex- exploratory with them. Yeah. Mary and I both just put our hands up in the air. Like if it's working for you, like we both just went like, yes, yes. Yeah, but yeah. I love that you're, that you're like, okay, so you're doing the program and whatever that program is, and you're working with your parts. And I think that's what would make all the difference and what brings in the spiritual aspect of that, you know, too, is mm-hmm. if I'm working with my parts while I'm doing a program. Right, exactly. Because people, um, especially people that have experienced trauma, have lost touch with their the spiritual part of them, parts of them, and have become really hopeless and discouraged often. And, you know, in IFS, just by not naming and labeling, you know, people open to what we call self-energy, but other people have different names for it, you know, yeah. but in IFS, we call it self-energy. Yeah. Which is why I like the idea of, uh, in the 12 steps of uh, a higher power, as you understand it, because for some people that are atheists or agnostics, I can just look out my window and that nature right there can be my my self-energy, my yeah. higher power. Yeah. 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 So I um, like that. Yeah. Right. It's open for what, however you, whatever that means to you. Yeah. That people can explore the spiritual path that works for them. Yeah. 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 And I love that about IFS too, right? That IFS isn't, is open to that, 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 yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Me too. Me too. And that's one of the attractions that I had for it is that it did have a space for some sort of spirituality, um, which we call self-energy. And that was something that was not so welcome in the therapy rooms. You know, when I started as a therapist, it really was something you didn't speak of much. Mm. So, you know, but because I did a lot of work with addictions and eating disorders, I was familiarized with that, that that could be helpful, you Mm. know, that some sort of connection like that, yeah. you know, as part of the healing, not just the psychotherapy aspect. Yeah. 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 And Jung talked about that. He talked about how his therapeutic skills, you know, and this is in the big book, um, were not working with this man that was suffering from acute alcoholism. And he, he named, I'm just paraphrasing that he had heard something um, about the spiritual path that might be helpful, you know, so they contribute uh, part of the big book to him or name him as one of the influences for developing AA is, you know, so, wow. yeah, with his idea around spirituality, but he also knew about parts a little bit too, right? Yeah. 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 I love that. And so can we talk about AA and the integration of IFS with the 12 step programs? I think it's a great program, but I don't, I don't push it on people. I I'm sure not to have an agenda, but I just make offerings to people over time. They're really two different things in that one is psychotherapy, I've as a psychotherapy and AA is self-help, as I said earlier. But the way I've worked with people is we work with parts that come up as they work through their steps or parts that come up around going to meetings or parts that come up around in interaction with someone. So we use um, the experiences of the 12 steps. It could be AA or NA or any of that as a trailhead for some of the work that we can work on. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Yeah. Or for people who are extremely isolated, um, because isolation really is part of addictions and eating disorders, the more you get into it, the more parts become more and more disconnected from others. So often what they're looking for is connection. So I might make an offer that, you know, there is this place that you can get connection and what comes up for you about that, you know. Mm. Um, One of the struggles people have, of course, is calling themselves uh, a name. I am an alcoholic or I am this or I am that. But a lot of people, that, that I work with in the program um, have actually been some of my best IFS clients because when they say that, they know they're more than that because that's part of the, the recovery. And it just helps them delineate that it's really a part, you know, and it begins to help them tune into that voice of addiction, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they get attuned to it. They begin to know that this is my drinking part talking to me, or this is my drugging part. This is my gambling part or sex addiction part talking to me right now. So, so we usually free frame it more like that. Yeah. So that can be helpful for folks too, but not everybody wants to go to 12 step programs and we start wherever people are at, you know? Um, So people, I have two thoughts. One is people seem to have a hard time with the spirituality, the powerlessness, and then naming, you know, I'm an, I'm an addict or I'm a drug addict or 
whatever that is. Right. Um, and do you, okay, so I guess I, I guess I want to talk about that. Like, what, why do you think people have such a hard time and give A such a hard, <laughs> or so hard on A about some of these things? And then I think my other question is um, more about that. I love that because it's part, the um, I'm an addict as a part of me as an a- addict. It reminds me of that I'm letting my addict part speak and I'm actually getting to know it and I'm kind of stepping into it instead of, um, you know, pushing it away or, you know, trying to act like it's not there. And so by naming that, then that's going to allow me to get to know it a little bit more. I think that's what you're saying. I don't know that I have a question there, but I just, be able to I recognize like that. it. Yeah. Be yeah. Able to recognize it. Yeah. The other four, the fourth thing I would add that people have difficulty with is the, um, um, feeling like they don't fit in when they go to like a group or, oh, or meet people okay. in those programs. So, um, there's a few different reasons why that might come up. Um, some people have never been to any of these meetings and don't know anything about them. And uh, a lot of therapists actually are basing their information upon what someone has reported to them, but they've never experienced it themselves. Yeah. Or what someone's parts have reported to them. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's the addictive part. A lot of times making a reason not to go because it feels threatened mm-hmm. about having to stop its behavior. And um, other times it could be that these are trailheads. If you ask the part, um, where else is it that you have felt you, you haven't fit in? Or can you name some other times you felt powerless? It's actually a segue into probably doing some exile work. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, so sometimes I just get curious and I ask those questions and don't worry about if they're going to a meeting or not. So tell me a little bit more about when you first felt like you didn't fit in in life. Ah, yeah. So maybe we'll work with that a little bit and see what that's like. And well, I've reframed uh, how we look at the disease, the concept of disease. Um, and actually, I'm I'm not going to just name how I reframed it, but there's a few ways that a few of us IFS therapists look at it. And um, so one of the things that people have difficulty with is that uh, oh, a disease. I must be a defective and all that. So the idea of um, uh, you know, these things being a disease came out of the idea of moving away from moral judgment. So we used to judge people with addictions as having moral uh, failures. So the original intention was to do that, but the ad, that, that led to um, a lot of research and reframing of it to the point where people felt that now they were genetic defective, right? Disease. Yeah. So I became curious about what does disease really mean? And it means a state of imbalance or disharmony. Mm. And in IFS, we want to restore harmony, right? Mm -hmm. So that's part of my integration is, well, really, you're not a defective. You know, and I've had many clients come in saying that it was just me. I'm the bad one in the family. I'm a genetic, you know, genetic uh, mutant or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, let's just explore that a little more. And um uh, so as we explore it, we become more curious about um, how that really fits in their system, right? Mm, yeah. Like what's happening with them inside. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it fits with the story probably they've been told or the way they've been feeling is that there's, they're the bad one. Yeah. And when I, when I say to them, you know, it really just means disharmony. Does it feel like your system is feeling a little out of, ba- out of balance? Yeah. 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 Um, and that actually makes so much sense too, that it, that it is, it was meant to take away the shame, but that doesn't, that didn't. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause our cultural belief system about addictions and eating disorders hasn't changed. Yeah. So we just impose that same, the burdens that we carry around that sort of thing, just impose it on the next language that comes, you know? Yeah. And now um, we've changed in the DSM, uh, the phraseology is substance use disorder, which a lot of people are pushing back on, but um, you know, that's gonna end up having a negative connotation too, unless we reframe, unless we reframe or change our inner belief system around addictions and eating disorders. It doesn't matter what we call it, mm. <laughs> unless our parts like over oh, the burdens we carry around all that, mm. yeah. And I, and I was just, I was just thinking about how, how much of that is back to that idea of shaming 
like I feel shame. And so then I'm going to shame others. Like, well, I don't have those issues you do. So and now I'm doing a push away with my hand, like, a, you know, sort of, that's just more shaming on the other person. Yeah. We see it in families, like, um, you know, in families where there's addiction, they say that I'm just going to use alcoholism, but it could be drugs that, um, or eating disorder or, or, you know, porn addiction, but that we, we impact five people, right? So based on that, there should be five times more people showing up in the therapy room or the 12 step rooms around that. But people feel, and I felt this too, when I first went to Al-Anon and ACOA meetings that, um, I felt that, you know, I'm really kind of angry that I have to be here for those people over there that did all those terrible things to me. Yeah. you know, yes. and, you know, it's if it fair. wasn't for them, yeah, yeah, it's not fair. I'm so angry at them. And so um, then I, I finally realized that it was like a gift, you know, that I began to do an exploration of myself that I never would have done, if not exposed mm. to this. And so it can become a wonderful journey, but a lot of people just don't want to go there. They do push it away. Their parts push it away because they feel ashamed that they were connected to that in any kind of way. Yeah. yeah, that it's a reflect, they feel that it's a reflection on them, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. That's beautiful. And I can't, I'm, I'm imagining the listeners right now, like how many, how many listeners are really struggling with what you just said, that idea that it's a gift, like this awful trauma, or even my own addiction, which my guess is there's trauma there, what, you know, so the, whatever awful, awful, awful stuff ha- is happening or has happened, that it's actually a gift and it invites me to explore. So tell me about that. Cause I'm, I'm just guessing that people might be like, really? <laughs> they might have a hard time with that. Well, it requires, you know, what we call an IFS a U-turn, you know, which that belief is not unique to IFS. That's something that we've known about in you know codependency work and things like that, but it requires a U-turn. And it, for, for me to make a U-turn or for someone to make a U-turn, there might be a part that comes up that blames them or shames them or, or feels like they're gonna, going to discover that they're a bad person if they look inside, right? So it's scary to really want to look inside. Our parts are all like not about that. They want to keep everything contained. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yet, if I can allow myself to look inside, I can discover not just difficult things I carry and burdens, but also many gifts that have gotten hidden. Right. We talk a lot about letting the parts take back in what they've lost when they took on their burdens. And when I do this work, when we do this work, we can take back in the gifts. Uh, Mitchie Rose says what we were intended to be. Right. Mm. What the part was intended to be into our system. And. Mm we can go to this next level of, of development in our consciousness, mm. right? But many of us are too afraid to take that journey because it requires a leap of faith. Mm. And that's a tough one. Yeah. Because it's the unknown. It's something we can't put words to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about for people that say, I have to, I have to hold on to this resentment or this thing because they, they don't get to get away with what they did to me. Mm -hmm. And so if I, if I step into this exploration and I do this healing, then that it's not, it doesn't mean anything. Like it doesn't make them pay for what they did. That's a protector, right? So the part doesn't want the person to be close to them. Right. So we would explore the part and I don't know exactly it would answer differently for different people, but I might ask, the, have them ask the part, what are you concerned would happen if you let go of that resentment? I mean, you don't have to let go of it, but what are you concerned would happen? And what is this part hoping for you? And, you know, I might hear things like, well, I wouldn't want that person to do this to me again. Or if I let my guard down, you know, this other part of me that got me hooked into this person anyway might show back up. And I might say, hey, maybe we want to work with that part that's holding those wounds and hurts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and sometimes, you know, we need to sit with that resentment for a while. Because sometimes something really bad did happen and that person wasn't allowed to feel that, right? Because we do exile anger and resentment as well. Yeah. 
And sometimes we just really need to work on our therapist parts to be able to hang in with that until the person can let go of it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Like give them space to be able to be angry Mm -hmm. and resentful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let that part, let that part express that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people don't want to let go of things, especially combat veterans I've known and work with um, many people because they're afraid that if they let go of things that what happened is going to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you handle that when that's a part sphere? Check in. I would want to know more about that, you know, more about what that meaning, what that means to have it not to be forgotten. Right. Mm -hmm. And then just notice how the parts have had to hang on to it in a certain way. And what if we could find a way to have it not be forgotten, but to have, you know, have to carry the load. Mm -hmm. How would that be? So we're not going to forget it. You know, what are, what are some ways that that part would need to have it be so it wasn't forgotten and you could let go of the load and the burden you're carrying around it. Yeah. It's beautiful. So there's some, some negotiating, some talking with what the parts need, you know. Um, how does it feel to shift into IFS addiction, eating disorders, and group work? Feels okay. I love it. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. yeah. And I, I guess I'm curious how that's different than 12 steps. Mm. Well, it's a lot different because first of all, it's facilitated by a therapist. And um, so there's interactions that go on amongst group members, um, there's dialogue, there's um, topics, experientials, a lot of things that you would never do in a 12 step meeting because it's not safe because there's not a facilitator, you gotcha. know, a specific facilitator that varies from person to person. So, um, and it becomes, um, well, 12 steps become a family too, but it comes to like a family. So what I discovered even before I knew IFS, um, well, first of all, I'm the last person that should be doing group work because my first experience with group therapy was a horrendous experience. Um, I was when I was in college, they invited us to be part of a sensitivity group that was like a big big deal then. And the person facilitating it was the RA, and they didn't know a thing about group process. So um, people were allowed to give really bad unself-led horrible feedback to the group members um unsolicited you know it was not good so i shied away from groups for years uh, every time i went to therapy i'd tell my therapist in the first session don't ever send me to a group what changed my mind of course is when i went to 12 steps and i felt the energy of mm. of the group so i got this what we call self-energy today but i felt this energy but i got this idea when i was um training to be a marriage and family therapist um, that I really liked group because I had to take a class in it and I loved it. I took a class in it and the woman who taught it was a bioenergetics. So it was really experiential and really cool. So I decided to start a group and I discovered that when I was working with folks with eating disorders and addictions, that they got better faster if we were also doing group work along with the individual, Mm. because an individual, you don't get to see the interactions that go on in the person, you know? So you don't get to see how they interact with people and uh, those sorts of things because it's one-on-one. So, so that became a really big part of the work I do, you know, and I still, I only do one now, but I used to do like three or four live groups a week. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> and different. Yeah. I've done all kinds of groups, panic and anxiety, which is really, I've done anger, which was really an addiction group. Panic and anxiety was really trauma. Um, done uh, eating disorders, which brings in other firefighters and um, done ad- just general addiction groups. Um, so done a bunch of different groups, family, multi-family groups. So I just feel like it's a really powerful model of, of work. And many people who would uh, also benefit from a 12-step group are afraid to go. The group, group place is a great place to start you know, and they might do it for a number of years before they're willing to do the next piece, but Mm. um, yeah, or not, you know, it's just a different paradigm and it's, it's much more powerful. We can do a lot more experiential things and there's interactive stuff we can do that it's hard to do an individual. Mm. So I just love it. Um, I guess it's interesting that we're kind of ending with this because I was thinking 
it brings us back around to feeling connected and it brings us back around to not feeling shame and speaking for our addictive parts or our addicted parts because we're in a group. And so if I'm in a group, then I'm I'm connecting and I'm working to connect and I'm not feeling as much shame as I talk about the parts of me that, uh, you know, struggle with eating my firefighters that eat all the cookies. And then this person's also talking about that. Then that helps my parts feel connected and it helps my parts not feel shame. And it helps me speak for those parts in a clearer, more precise, I'm using my hands again, precise way. And, and I could see all of the things that we've been talking about today really happening in, in a group like that. That's right. You just, tapped into something that's very important is the whole idea of reducing shame. And um, when you look around a room and you see that there's other people that look just like the teacher down the street or the police officer down the road or your friend next door, and they have the same thing going on as you, and you thought you were different and you were the only one, mm. it's a huge shift, mm. a huge inner shift, even before you start doing any of the other work that moment of connection and that moment that some of that shame is let go of because you realize you're not so bad. You're not so different from other humans. Mm, it's beautiful. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And that, I think that brings in the spiritual part too, right? Like I'm not so different mm -hmm. as other humans and there's a spiritual connection, right? Like that, something that ties us all together. That's right. So what else do you want to say before I ask you the last question? What do you feel like you want the listeners to know? I feel that we're just all human beings trying to struggle through this life and deal with the ups and downs. And um, that, you know, through my work with IFS, I've developed way more compassion for people and I do believe that compassion, not just connection, but compassion is really what's going to heal our planet. Mm -hmm. And um, I delight in hearing everyone's story, even if it's a way different story than mine, mm -hmm. right? So from the perspective of the IFS therapist, I guess the two most powerful healing agents are our curiosity and our compassion. You know, curiosity, mm -hmm. not in an intellectual way, but in a non-judging way. So even as a non-therapist, if we were to be this way in the world more, you know, there'd be a lot less conflict. Yeah. So. And, and even as people are listening and they're, you know, someone who's a non-therapist and or a therapist, and we're thinking of their own addictive parts or addicted, addicted parts, imagine giving more curiosity to those parts of you that are struggling mm -hmm. with addiction and then giving some compassion to those parts that are just eating all the cookies and drinking all the drinks and smoking all the stuff and watching all the porn and imagine being curious and compassionate towards those parts. It's hard to believe that we could be, but we can. It doesn't mean we're going to stay doing it forever. It's just yeah. acknowledging that, you know, we try to get through life the best we can sometimes. And sometimes that's all there is are these addictive behaviors until we discover what else is out there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And what else is in here? Yes, exactly. That we have those other resources, right? That, that part mm -hmm. thinks um, one of one of one thing that I've been hearing when I go to reach for those cookies, my firefighter says, you know, but what else can I do? This is all I can do. And I've been hearing that a lot lately. Like this is all I can do. And so yeah, that part doesn't know that that I have other resources. And so yeah. Right. And where did the part come to believe it was all that it could do? Yeah. Maybe there was a time that there was all that that part could do. When I'm five, maybe all there was was the cookie jar. Yeah. But when right. I'm an adult, you know, does that part know that there's options for me now? Does that part see you? So my last question, if you weren't doing all that you're doing for the world, what would you like to do instead? Uh, well, <laughs> different parts would answer differently. One part of me would like to hang out in my garden and do more of my gardening and things like that and cook really nice dinners, which I still like to do, but I'd like to do more of. And another part would be out connecting with all my family and friends. And another part would be out traveling the world more. 
once of course COVID was done, but yeah. 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 yeah I'd like to, I'd like to explore the world more. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Mary, thank you so much. This was wonderful and just so good to meet you and be with you yeah. and talk to you like face to face like this. Yeah. I'm glad I've, I've got to meet you finally. I've heard really lovely things about you. Oh, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Right, I'm just keep gonna... up your good work. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.